lubrication is vital to the efficient and dependable operation of all types of machinery. Its principles work all around us all the time. Right now, lubrication is letting the machine playing this tape run properly. And lubrication is also required for the machines in your plant. Because it's so important for efficient plant operation, lubrication is a subject to discuss in detail. And that's what we're going to do. We'll see what lubrication is, its physical properties, and how and why it's used in a plant. Well, to do this, let's start with a definition. Lubricate means to make smooth or slippery, but it can also mean to apply a lubricant. A lubricant is a substance capable of reducing friction, heat, and wear when applied between solid surfaces, which make lubricants and lubrication very important to understand. Lubricants are necessary because friction makes machine parts more difficult to keep in motion. Friction is the resistance to motion that exists between two bodies in contact. It causes heat and wear. The more friction, the more heat and wear. Lubricants act to reduce friction. Now this makes it easier to keep machines running smoothly and it cuts down on the amount of heat and wear caused by friction. A machine's moving parts generally experience three types of friction, sliding, rolling, and fluid. A sliding friction occurs when two surfaces in contact slide past each other. This type of friction offers the most resistance to motion, so machinery is usually built to minimize or eliminate it. One way of building a machine to minimize sliding friction is to place rolling elements between the moving surfaces. This is the principle behind rolling contact bearings. Rolling contact bearings experience rolling friction that is considerably less severe than sliding friction. Still, they must be properly lubricated to reduce heat and wear. The useful life of a rolling contact or anti-friction bearing would be drastically shortened if the bearing were operated dry. Another way to build a machine to reduce friction is to separate two sliding surfaces by a film of lubricant. As long as the surfaces do not touch, sliding friction is eliminated. There's still some fluid friction within the lubricant, but it's much less than sliding friction. Fluid friction is the resistance to motion that exists within a fluid, and it's not as obvious as other types of friction. Besides lubricants' three basic functions, reducing friction, heat, and wear, they perform other jobs. They serve as hydraulic mediums, and they prevent dirt and corrosion-causing contaminants from coming in contact with moving surfaces. A hydraulic medium is like the brake fluid in your car that transfers force from the brake pedal to the brakes on the wheels. In a hydraulic medium, the main function of the lubricant is to transfer force, not just to make things slippery. The presence of a lubricant prevents dirt and corrosion-causing contaminants from touching the moving surfaces. When fresh lubricant flows between moving surfaces, the lubricant tends to flush dirt and contaminants away. Well, now that we've discussed their functions, let's talk about the different kinds of lubricants. There are three general kinds of lubricants, liquid, semi-solid, and solid. Now, liquid lubricants are oils. There are many varieties of oils, and we'll cover them later. Semi-solid lubricants are greases, while solid lubricants include metal elements and several kinds of solid chemicals. We'll discuss these varieties later. For now, remember that lubricants can be liquid, semi-solid, or solid. Well, to wrap up, lubricate means to make smooth or slippery or to apply a lubricant. A lubricant is a substance that reduces friction, heat, and wear. By doing so, lubricants help machine parts work properly. Well, take some time now to go over all of the material and clear up any questions or problems you might have. Lubricants are made from one of four groups of materials, animal, vegetable, mineral, 
and synthetic. Originally, animal and vegetable lubricants were the most widely used, but they've been almost completely replaced by mineral and synthetic types, neither of which decompose as easily. Animal lubricants include those made of fats from animals like cattle, sheep, or hogs, and lard is one example of this kind of lubricant. Animal lubricants can be labeled by the kind of animal fat used and whether it is hard or soft. The lubricants made from vegetables are vegetable oils. Processing various vegetables produces lubricants like olive oil, castor oil, linseed oil. Mineral oils are petroleum products and come from refined crude oil. Most of the lubricants you'll work with in your plant will be mineral oils. Because of their stability, mineral oils perform their lubricating functions under high temperature and pressure. Synthetics are man-made lubricants. They're manufactured from a mineral oil base or from other non-petroleum-based substances. We'll talk about some of the other substances a bit later. Right now, though, we must understand the four common properties of these lubricants. Viscosity, flash point, fire point, and pour point. The viscosity is a measure of the resistance of a fluid to flow. A thick fluid, like the oil here, has a high viscosity. While a thin fluid, like this oil, has a low one. The thinner the fluid, the lower its viscosity. Choosing a lubricant with the right viscosity is important because a lubricant that is too thin will not work properly, while one that is too thick will cause too much fluid friction. Viscosity is related to fluid friction. A liquid with high viscosity will produce more fluid friction than a liquid with low viscosity. Too much fluid friction causes overheating, makes it harder to start a machine. Choosing the lubricant with the right viscosity is complicated because viscosity is affected by the fluid's temperature and pressure. Higher temperatures mean lower viscosity because lubricants will thin as the temperature increases. On the other hand, if the lubricant thickens from lower temperatures, it will not lubricate properly and a thinner one must be used. Now the oil here has been heated. Notice how easily it, it pours into this container. Okay. Now, this oil is cold. The lower temperature has thickened the oil, raising its viscosity, and it pours more slowly. Now, if a lubricant is used where temperatures change rapidly, the viscosity index is important. The viscosity index is a measure of how thick or thin the lubricant gets when the temperature changes. Viscosity index helps in choosing what oil should be used under certain temperature conditions. An oil whose viscosity changes a small amount when the temperature changes has a high viscosity index. If an oil's viscosity changes greatly as the temperature changes, it has a low viscosity index. The pressure's effect on viscosity is the opposite of temperature's effect. When pressure goes up, viscosity also goes up. This is a factor in high pressure systems where thin oils are used because they will thicken enough to work properly at operating pressures. Also, high loads can create high pressure in a lubricant. If the lubricant is too thick, the resulting increase in viscosity could prevent the lubricant from working properly. This could cause equipment failure. Viscosity is a lubricant's most critical property, but the flash point, fire point, and the pour point are also important. Flash point is the temperature at which a lubricant's vapor will ignite when exposed to flame. At this temperature, only the vapor will burn. Here we have a sample of oil that is being heated. When it reaches the flash point, the oil vapor can be ignited. Fire point is the slightly higher temperature at which the lubricant will burn steadily, 
when exposed to a flame. This occurs because enough vapor is created to cause continued burning. Both flashpoint and firepoint are important to know for safety reasons. If flashpoint and firepoint are exceeded, a fire hazard exists. A pour point is the lowest temperature at which a lubricant will pour. Below the pour point, a lubricant will have thickened too much to flow by gravity. The pour point is especially important in machinery that must run in cold weather. Viscosity, flash point, fire point, and pour point are four properties of lubricants. Now it's time to discuss the factors that determine lubricant selection. Basically, four things must be considered. Pressure, speed, temperature, and environment. Pressure affects the selection of a lubricant because it changes a lubricant's viscosity. The greater the pressure, the greater the viscosity. Speed is a selection factor because there is a higher rate of wear at high speeds than at slower speeds. As a result, a lubricant used in a high speed situation must be able to handle extra punishment. Temperature, like pressure, affects a lubricant's viscosity. Both normal temperature and any possible variations must be considered when selecting a lubricant. This is where the viscosity index comes in. Flash point, fire point, and pour point help determine the temperatures at which a lubricant can be used. The lubricant's surroundings or environment is the fourth factor. Certain lubricants are better in dirtier or duster areas, and there are other environmental considerations. These include whether the equipment is mobile, and what kind of atmospheric conditions exist. You'll need this information to avoid errors and to understand why a particular lubricant is used. However, you won't normally make the final decision. Usually, a lubricant supplier will help decide what lubricants are to be used in any particular place. Most plants have surveys made by the suppliers. And the results of these surveys serve as guides for selecting lubricants. You need to understand the basic reasons why particular lubricants are chosen, because you are the ones who will be doing the lubrication. We haven't finished talking about the things that make lubricants different. One of these is lubricant additives. An additive is a material added to a lubricant to improve its properties. Additives are used to help lubricants withstand the large loads and severe operating conditions often found in modern plants. Additives can lower pour point, alter viscosity, and perform other helpful functions. Keep in mind, though, that additives in lubricants may not be compatible. When adding lubricant to a partially full system, the same type of lubricant must be used. Never mix different lubricants. Be sure that lubricant added to a system is the right one for that system, that is, compatible with the lubricant already there. Additives are explained more fully in your text. We've now covered four groups of lubricants materials, animal, vegetable, mineral, and synthetic, and four properties of lubricants, viscosity and the viscosity index, flash point, fire point, and pour point. We also went over four factors that affect lubricant selection, pressure, speed, temperature, and environment. So uh, why don't you take some time now to read through all of the material we've discussed so far. So far, we've talked about lubricants in general. Now we're going to talk specifically about oils. Oils are liquid lubricants, and mineral oils, which are petroleum-based, are the ones most commonly used. Their greater stability makes them more reliable than animal or vegetable oils. And they're cheaper than synthetic oils. You can categorize oils by their use, but these categories are not clearly defined. The right oil for a particular job depends on 
specific design, construction, and operating factors that vary from case to case. Pressure, speed, temperature, and environment must be considered when selecting an oil. We'll separate general purpose oils into four categories, circulating, gear, engine, and spindle oils. Each of these are used differently and may have different properties depending on their use. Circulating oil can be divided into two types, circulating lube oil and hydraulic oil. Both of these are classed as circulating oils because they circulate through a piping system or move freely within a closed area. Sometimes the oil in one system is used for both lubrication and hydraulics. For instance, steam turbines are built to use the same oil for lubrication and hydraulic control. However, these oils are not always interchangeable. Gear oil is a general purpose oil because it has many uses. Often, gear oil will be high viscosity. There are many kinds of gears, and each can be used under a variety of operating conditions. Now, those operating conditions determine the characteristics of the lubricating oil used. Gear oils almost always contain extreme pressure additives, so they can operate under high pressures that occur when gear teeth mesh. Now, engine oil is also used in different ways in various engines and machines. An engine oil is likely to be used where the working environment subjects the oil to severe conditions. Severe operating conditions make it necessary to periodically replace the oil. Spindle oil is used to lubricate bearings on small shafts, especially when the shafts are turning at high speeds. These shafts are often called spindles. Spindle oil is highly refined mineral oil with low viscosity. It can be used for lubricating delicate instruments and other sensitive equipment. Besides the four general purpose oils, there are different special purpose oils. Special purpose oils have characteristics that make them suitable for specific service conditions. Some of these special purpose oils are covered in your text. Remember, though, that every oil has a special purpose because each oil's characteristics are considered before the oil is used under certain service conditions. Now that covers some of the classifications of oils. Now let's discuss the most important way that oil provides lubrication, film lubrication. Film lubrication is the separation of moving and stationary surfaces within a bearing of an oil film. It is the preferred lubrication method in any bearing. A bearing built so that surfaces can be separated by an oil film will carry more load than a bearing whose surfaces rub against each other. Now let's take a look at how this works in a plain journal bearing. A plain journal bearing consists of a bearing sleeve which surrounds a shaft. The space between the bearing and the shaft is filled with lubricating oil. When the shaft is at rest, most of the oil is squeezed out from between the shaft and the bearing by the weight of the shaft. And when this happens, the bearing and shaft are in metal-to-metal -metal contact. When the shaft begins to roll, its motion drags oil underneath it. Oil sticks to the shaft as it turns and is carried between the two surfaces. The shaft is lifted away from the surface of the bearing by a film of oil. As the rotational speed increases, more and more oil is drawn under the shaft. It forms a wedge of oil that keeps the surfaces of the shaft and bearing apart. This wedge-shaped oil layer supports the shaft and prevents it from touching the bearing surface. Oil is also used to lubricate anti-friction or rolling contact bearings. Here, full film lubrication usually doesn't occur. Only enough oil is supplied to keep the bearing surfaces wetted. There are two reasons for this. The amount of friction produced in an anti-friction bearing is reduced by the rolling action of the bearing's balls or rollers. Since very little sliding takes place, not as much lubricant is needed to reduce friction. The other reason is that too much oil in an anti-friction bearing could make it overheat. If an anti-friction bearing 
were completely filled with oil, the balls or rollers would have to push the oil aside as they turned within the bearing. And this creates more friction than occurs when you use less oil. Well, we've covered some of the ways that oils are categorized and talked about four general purpose oils, circulating, gear, engine, and spindle oils. We also showed the lubrication of a plain journal bearing and an anti-friction bearing. Take some time now to go over this material in your text and to read this segment on special purpose oils. Oh, now is also a good opportunity to talk with your instructor about any problems or questions you have. Well, we've seen what oils are and how they're used, but oil is not the only lubricant found in your plant. Greases are also common, and you need to know what they are and how they're chosen and why they're used. Well, let's start with a description. Normally, grease is a semi-solid lubricant made from a liquid lubricant and a thickening agent. Under some conditions, it can be solid, but usually it's in a gel-like state. The liquid lubricant used is generally a mineral oil, and the most common thickener is a form of soap. A grease thickening soap is a combination of a fat and a chemical element. The fat is typically animal fat, but vegetable or synthetic fats can also be used. The chemical elements are usually calcium, sodium, barium, or lithium, and they significantly affect how the grease is used. The important properties of grease are its melting point and its consistency. The grease's melting point is called its drop point because of the method used to measure it. The grease is heated slowly until fluid begins to drop from it. The temperature at which the drops form is the drop point. Now a grease's drop point is an important physical property because you don't want grease to liquefy while it's in use. If the operating temperature of an area is higher than the grease's drop point, the grease would tend to flow away from the area where it was needed for lubrication. Consistency or stiffness is an important physical property for much the same reason. If a grease is too hard, it will be difficult to apply. If it is too soft, it will be difficult to keep where it is needed. Either of these situations could result in inadequate lubrication. That could result in the failure of the lubricated parts. Well, you might be wondering why we bother to use grease at all. Well, there are four reasons, all of which depend on the lubricant's operating conditions. Grease may be necessary to be sure that lubricant will stay in place, to assure that contaminants do not get between lubricating surfaces, when operating temperatures are too high to use oil, and when frequent oil lubrication is not easy to do. A grease whose consistency is properly chosen for its operating conditions is easier than oil to keep between lubricated surfaces. Now, as long as grease remains semi-solid, it tends to stay where it is placed. Now, liquid oil is much more likely to flow away from where it is needed. Under conditions when both oil and grease would flow out of an area, it is much easier to retain grease with a seal than to retain oil. Keeping the lubricant in is important because leaks could contaminate surrounding areas or cause a fire hazard. Besides being easier to retain, grease is better than oil at keeping contaminants out because it forms a better seal. Keeping lubricants in and contaminants out are two reasons for using grease. Another reason is grease's ability to maintain its lubricating characteristics at high temperatures. At operating temperatures above 212 degrees Fahrenheit, or 100 centigrade, it may be easier to find a grease than an oil with the necessary lubricating properties. The soap base in most kinds of grease makes them more resistant to the adverse effects of the high temperature than oils. However, 
Oils can only be used in high temperature situations if additional equipment is employed to keep the oil cool. For example, a circulating system and coolers will keep the oil from overheating. Finally, relubrication does not have to be done as often with grease as with oil. This makes it more convenient and practical to use grease in areas that are difficult to reach. Well, there are other reasons for choosing grease over oil, too. The manufacturer of a particular piece of equipment will consider all the variables and recommend a certain type of grease for the parts lubrication. It's your job to make sure that these recommendations are followed. And the manufacturer may also recommend how much grease should be used. Too much or too little could cause a failure. Well, since we've talked about the reasons for using grease, let's see some examples of how grease is applied. Anti-friction bearings often have housings that retain excess grease. Housings are built this way to keep dirt out and the right amount of grease in. Now, this can cause a problem if too much grease is put into a bearing because there's no place for the grease to go. Care must be taken to avoid spreading too much grease into a bearing. Too much grease will cause the bearing to overheat. The amount of grease that can be packed into a bearing depends on the construction of the bearing housing. In some bearing housings, there will be a drain plug or another way for excess grease to leave the bearings. In this case, the bearing may be completely filled with grease. Then, when the machine is first operated after greasing, the drain plug should be removed for a few minutes to allow excess grease to leave the bearing. Other types of bearing housings will contain an expansion space for excess grease. Here too, the bearing can be completely filled with grease. Excess grease will be forced into the expansion space when the machine is operated. Sometimes bearing housings are built with neither a drain nor an expansion space. Under these circumstances, it is vital to avoid starting with too much grease in the bearing. The bearing should be packed no more than one half full of grease. Care must be taken to avoid over-greasing. There are three ways to make sure you have enough grease in the bearing without worrying about over-greasing. One is to fully pack the bearing and allow excess grease to run off while the machine operates. If there's no bearing housing drain, there may be enough expansion space to completely fill the bearing with grease. When the bearing is in operation, the excess grease will be forced into the expansion space. When there is no drain or expansion space in the housing, do not pack the bearing more than one half full of grease. To properly grease an anti-friction bearing from a fitting in the housing, check the grease fitting and select the appropriate matching fitting for the grease gun. Also, make sure the right kind of grease is in the gun. Remove the drain plug from the housing. Wipe the fitting clean. And then carefully add new grease while the machine runs. Wipe the fitting again after adding grease. Let the machine run a few minutes with the drain plug out. As the machine operates, Excess grease will be forced out of the drain. After a few minutes, replace the drain plug. In a sliding surface bearing, like a plain journal bearing, the usual practice is to apply grease with a grease gun while the shaft is turning. Do this until new grease is forced out both ends of the bearing. Any excess grease rapidly works its way out. A sliding surface bearing is easier to grease because you usually don't have to worry about blowing out grease seals. There are so many different kinds of bearings that it's impossible to give specific rules on how to grease each one of them. The best way to assure proper greasing is to get familiar with your equipment and to use common sense on the job. Still, there are a few general things you should remember about greasing a bearing. First. Cleanliness is always important. Second, grease should not be pumped in too rapidly because grease seals in the bearing housing could be damaged. Old grease must be able to leave the bearing either through a drain or other means. 
finally, a bearing should never be over greased. A rule of thumb sometimes used with this type of grease gun is to apply no more than three shots of grease at a time. Well, that takes care of grease, its characteristics, and why it is used instead of oil. We've also gone over the greasing of sliding surface and anti-friction bearings. Take a few minutes now to go over all of the material in your text and straighten out any questions or problems you might have. We've said that there are three kinds of lubricants, liquid, semi-solid, and solid. We've already discussed liquid lubricants, oils, and semi-solid lubricants, greases. Now it's time to talk about solid lubricants and how and why they are used. Solid lubricants are divided into two types, organic and inorganic. Organic lubricants come from living things, while inorganic lubricants come from non-living things like minerals. Organic solid lubricants include fat and wax. Fat and wax were among the first lubricants ever used. Today, though, they have been almost completely replaced by synthetics or mineral oils. Inorganic solid lubricants include graphite and molybdenum disulfide. Both of these are layer-like minerals. When the minerals act as a lubricant, these layers slide over one another, reducing the friction that would occur if the metal parts were in direct contact. Graphite is usually suspended in water, alcohol, or oil. It has excellent high temperature characteristics, retaining its lubricating properties up to 662 degrees Fahrenheit, or 350 centigrade. Under some conditions, its maximum service temperature can be increased to 2,120 degrees Fahrenheit or 1,000 degrees centigrade. For this reason, graphite is used for lubricating soot blowers and other high temperature equipment. Molybdenum disulfide can be used in a number of forms. It can be a dry powder or it can be suspended in water or oil. It has a good high temperature characteristic, but its maximum service temperature is lower than graphite. One way that molybdenum disulfide is used is to coat threads on nuts and bolts that are used at high temperatures. Another lubrication method that uses solids is the application of a coating. A coatings prevent metal to metal contact by providing a solid covering for a metal surface. This type of lubrication is usually used in combination with another kind of lubricant. If an oil film breaks down and allows two surfaces to come in contact, the coatings lubricate the surfaces. For example, Teflon is sometimes used to coat the sides of pistons in internal combustion engines. This prevents the cylinder and piston from being damaged if the oil film between them breaks down. Besides all the mineral lubricants we've discussed, there are several man-made or synthetic lubricants in use today. Synthetics are lubricating compounds that must be manufactured. Synthetic lubricants are now being used in many situations where mineral oils were once used. This is because modern industrial lubricating needs are exceeding the limits of mineral oils. The only thing restricting the use of synthetics is their high cost. More and more, though, they're worth that higher price. Synthetics improved properties result in increased service life for both lubricant and equipment. Well, we've now explained the difference between solid organic lubricants, like fat and wax, and solid inorganic lubricants, like graphite and molybdenum disulfide. Review this material now in your text and take some time to ask your instructor questions or to clear up any problems you might be having.
lubricants are usually delivered in large drums. The way the lubricant is handled between delivery and use is an important factor for a good lubrication program. You can buy the best lubricants around, but they won't do you any good unless they're handled properly. After a lubricant has been delivered, it is often stored in its container for a long time before it's used. The containers are stored inside or outside, depending on the plant's available space. The lubricant must be protected from four things. Weather, contamination, spills, and fire. Outside, lubricants are covered to protect them. The covering keeps moisture away from the metal drums. An unprotected metal drum will eventually corrode, causing leaks that'll waste the lubricant. A covering, either permanent like a shed, or temporary like a canvas or plastic cover, will be of some help in protecting the lubricant from the weather. Whatever covering method is used, the drums should be laid on their sides. In this position, the drums are less likely to corrode and leak. Container leaks can cause contamination and spill the lubricant, making it unusable. Not only that, but such lubricant spills can damage the environment. One way lubricant can spill is through leaks caused by rust. Drums stored standing up are likely to rust at their top where water stands, or at the bottom where the drum is exposed to groundwater. If the drum is stored on its side, the portion closest to the ground can rust because the metal is likely to get wet and stay wet. It's best to store the drums on a rack to keep them off the ground. Many states have tough regulations dealing with the storage and handling of lubricants, so you must be extremely careful to avoid damaging the drums and spilling the lubricant. Most lubricants are combustible, so fire is always a consideration. One reason for storing lubricants outside is to keep them far enough away from buildings and equipment to minimize the damage from a possible fire. The most problems with outside storage can be avoided by storing the lubricant indoors. When lubricants are stored indoors, weather is not much of a problem. However, you must still guard against contamination, spills, and fire. When the plant needs a lubricant, the drums are moved from bulk storage to a central location in the plant where it can be dispensed. If a lubricant is taken from outside storage in cold weather, it should be allowed to warm up indoors for several days before it is used. Low temperatures can thicken lubricants, and make them unusable until they have been thoroughly warmed. Once a lubricant container has been opened, you must keep the lubricant clean after lubricant is removed from a drum, the drum should be resealed to avoid contamination. Also, some kinds of lubricant must be used completely once their containers are opened. When you dispense more than one lubricant from the same plant location, it is very important to properly identify each type. The original shipping containers will clearly state what they hold, but any time a lubricant is placed in another container, the new container must be labeled correctly. Incorrect labeling could cause the wrong lubricant to be applied to a piece of equipment which could lead to extensive damage. It could also lead to accidental mixing of different types of lubricant. The use of such a mixture could cause equipment damage. Another way of avoiding mixing different types of lubricant is to never return lubricant that has been removed to its original drum. This could contaminate the drum's entire contents. In most plants, open lubricant containers are stored in a separate room. This reduces the chance of fire, and makes it easier to keep the lubricant clean. This lubricant room, or oil room, must be clean and well lighted and have some kind of fire control equipment. Besides new oil, contaminated oil is often stored in the oil room before it is disposed of. Such oil must be clearly marked contaminated. If possible, contaminated oil should be stored separately from new oil in order to avoid confusing the two. Contaminated oil must be disposed of carefully. This can be done in three ways. Return the contaminated oil to the oil vendor, incinerate the contaminated oil, or purify and reuse it 
if all the contaminants can be removed. New lubricant that is stored properly will not become contaminated. This lubricant must be removed from its container for use. There are several ways of doing this. One way is a barrel pump that fits into the drum. There are different pumps for oil and grease because those lubricants have different consistencies. Using a barrel pump is an easy way to remove the lubricant without contaminating the rest of the drum. The way to remove lubricant with a barrel pump is to first clean the top of the drum. Then open the drum and remove the drum seal. Clean the pump and then insert it. Finally, tighten the pump onto the drum so it is secure. Now once the pump is installed, the drum must be vented for the barrel pump to work properly. A drum is usually vented by removing a small cap from the top of it before the pumping starts. After the drum is vented, remove the required amount of lubricant. Replace the cap after you finish pumping so the lubricant stays clean. Another way to remove oil is to attach a spigot to the top of the drum. The drum is laid on its side, vented, and oil is drawn from the spigot. The vent is replaced when you're finished. Drums with spigots are often placed in rocking frames that are stored in an upright position. When oil is required, the drum is rocked over on its side, the lubricant is withdrawn, and the drum is returned to its upright position. All the equipment used to transfer oil must be kept clean. Usually, buckets or other containers are set aside to handle lubricant only. Always use care to keep dirt out of the lubricant and to keep it from spilling. Sometimes, a funnel will be used to transfer oil from the drum or other container to a small piece of equipment. If a funnel is used, make sure it is clean. The main reason for transferring lubricant is to get it in the machinery. When doing this, make sure you add the correct amount of lubricant. Use the proper lubricant for that particular job and make sure all the filler caps are replaced tightly. Oil can become contaminated in handling or in use. And when that happens, it's often possible to purify it. Oil is generally purified four different ways. Gravity separation, centrifuge, a strainer, and a filter. Purification by gravity separation is based on the principle that contaminants like water and dirt are heavier than oil. If contaminated oil is allowed to stand in a tank, heavier contaminants will sink to the bottom. Usable oil can then be drawn from the top. Purification by centrifuge is based on the same principle, but when you use a centrifuge, its spinning force adds to the gravitational pull. Heavier contaminants move to the outside of the container and separate from the usable oil. This method is faster than gravity separation. Oil strainers also remove contaminants from liquid oil. As oil flows through a strainer, it is forced to pass through a screen that is often built like the wire mesh in a window screen. This screen traps solid particles, separating contaminants from usable oil. Now, filters are even more effective than screens. Filters are made from porous absorbent materials like cotton. Oil flows through the material and solid contaminants become trapped within it. Extremely small particles can then be removed from the oil. It is much harder for oil to flow through a filter than through a strainer. The added resistance to flow can make it impossible to use a filter, and another purification method must then be substituted. Sometimes, purification is done when it is needed, rather than at set times. You can find out when purification is needed by sampling the oil. The samples are sent to a laboratory and analyzed. If contaminants are found, the oil is purified. Analysis can also determine when it is time to change oil. Well, that takes care of this segment and our discussion of lubricants. To sum up, lubricants can be stored indoors 
and must be protected from four things. Weather, contamination, spills, and fire. Outdoors, the drums can be stored in a permanently covered area like a shed or under a temporary covering like a plastic or canvas cover. There are various ways to handle the lubricant, but all of them require that the lubricant be kept clean and that you use only the proper amount. Well, take some time now to go over all of the material. Remember that your texts contain additional information. Read it over and uh, clear up any questions or problems you might have.